G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here, and I would like to give Ana Luisa a big shout out for sponsoring this episode. So, are you looking for the perfect gift for yourself or for somebody special? Then Ana Luisa has you covered. Ana Luisa provides beautiful, sustainable jewelry that not only looks terrific, but also comes with a great price tag. And for my listeners, I managed to pick up an even better deal with a discount of 10% off of all products. Their jewellery starts at the affordable price of just $39, with no luxury markup, and I can attest to the quality of their product. I decided to get the missus a little something for our anniversary, the Anna Silver Necklace from the fine jewellery section, and man, was it the perfect gift. The glossy texture and the delicate design are exactly what I was looking for, and the composition of the piece is perfect because it doesn't catch on clothes or hair, which is great for my wife because she now wears it every time she goes out for business meetings or to catch up with friends. The company also offsets 100% of their carbon emissions, starting with the sourcing of their raw materials, all the way to the disposal of their pieces. The shipping is excellent and comes with custom taxes included for international customers, and with a 10% discount to boot, you can't go wrong. You can also check them out by following their Instagram or by subscribing to their newsletters, in which they always offer perks for engaging customers. So, go to analuisa.com forward slash scared, that's A-N-A-L-U-I-S-A dot com forward slash scared, treat yourself and your loved ones with a unique gift, and use my code SCARED to get 10% off. I absolutely recommend them. They're a great brand making beautiful, sustainable jewelry. Again, that's A-N-A-L-U-I-S-A dot com forward slash scared. You can also find a link in the description within tonight's episode. In 2003, I dropped out, went hitchhiking west with a friend, ran out of money after being homeless in Vancouver for a bit and burning every bridge possible, but we somehow managed to make it to Nanaimo. Because I was a terrible person at the time, I managed to get thrown out of the last place that we had to stay, a house that was in a small community, a three-hour walk outside of the city past Nickel Street. The house backed onto Weyerhauser logging land and was owned by a distant relative of my travelling partner. We had been working as roadies or groupies for this girl power punk band from Nanaimo called We've Been Had, and I had snuck one of them into the house and just, well, made a mess of everything. So my friend was angry at me. The band was also angry at me, and I'm certain two of them specifically wanted me dead. So to put a long story short, I'm homeless, broke, three hours outside of the city, and I turned towards the forest and walked into it. I had two bags of tomatoes, a bag of Wonder Bread, and some mayo. I also had a tent, a crank-powered lantern, a hitchhiker's backpack with an aluminium frame, and a bunch of weed. During the day, I would just wander around the forest... There was a massive open area about an hour's hike away from my camp where you could sit on a cliff face and see for miles around down into the forested valleys. It was a bit like nature's TV, I guess you could call it. I would go there in the morning, usually freezing my butt off, and the sun would warm the cliff face as it got closer to noon and I would warm up with it and just sit, get stoned and watch the crags for wildlife. It was a bizarre and foreign feeling to me, being thousands of kilometers away from anyone who cared about me back home. Canada really is immense. And then this new layer of isolation from everyone on the island after I messed everything up yet again. I felt almost monastic. Like, if I were to perish in these woods, it would be a just punishment or some sort of atonement, I guess. Anyway... I ate the food that I had sparingly and did whatever drugs that I had with me. Eventually, my friend forgave me enough to hike to my camp and visit, bringing stuff that he had stolen or busked for. Previously, we'd been working for a bit for this shady couple who made jewellery, and they were somehow connected to the local Hells Angels chapter. The whole community in the outskirts of this place was at the time, apparently. We would work buffing wheels all day, get a ton of metal flakes flung at us, no protection or anything. 
I remember being offered a job living in a grow house. It came with a Honda Civic, an Xbox apparently, and free cable. We turned it down though, and after that, I started to feel a sense of hostility from the locals. Which was another great addition to my now paranoia that I was living deep in the woods with. I would see a few animals every day while just sitting on the bluffs. I was too high and too far away to be noticed anyway. I saw bears and cougars, which made me nervous, I must admit. I had a knife, but it was small, so I made spears out of sturdy branches and spent a lot of sleepless nights clutching them in my tent like an idiot. It had been what felt like a month, I guess, or more maybe, when it first happened. So as I was about to head back to my camp with the last hour of sunlight, I saw a man standing on a rocky outcropping far across the crags. I could tell that he was heavily bared and shirtless and that he had a bit of a red mark on him near the left hand, I think. Either blood or a swath of fabric or something, but not much else from the distance that I was at. But one thing that I did notice was that he had a log in his left hand. Not a walking stick or a staff, like a full-sized log. I watched him standing there almost frozen until his head moved ever so slightly like... He was looking towards me, and at that, I just booked it back to camp, sort of terrified. That night, I really didn't sleep much, and when I got the courage to hike back a few days later, I was relieved that there didn't seem to be any sign of him. That is, until one hour before sunset when he showed up again. Same spot, same shirtless bearded guy dragging a full log in his left hand on a stone bluff a thousand meters away. And something about the way that he moved, or didn't maybe, even from the distance that I was at, was deeply unsettling. And I wasn't about to get the hills have eyed, so I walked back. I decided that I would leave the next morning, head back home, somehow. But what followed was two of the most surreal and terrifying nights of my entire life. You see... I returned back to camp late, and it was getting cloudy, so there was almost no light. I didn't have a flashlight, but I had a Coleman crank lantern that I would leave at camp, again like an idiot. This time, I barely made it back before it was pitch black. I could see my camp very well, but something about it just felt off. That's when I noticed that the tent zipper was open, which could have easily been my fault as I had done that before but this time it was unzipped so much I had to fish around in the tent flaps to dig the zipper out and when I finally got it free I heard a scraping sound something definitely not natural and it was coming from the direction of the animal trail I leapt into my tent freaking out I grabbed the crank lantern and I started reefing on it as I can still hear this deep bassy scraping sound I'm turning this crank and the lantern won't light up. I can still hear the scraping, but it also started to rain and the raindrops on the tent sounded so loud for some reason that I'm getting sort of disorientated and more freaked out. I can't see anything and now I also can't hear anything. The lantern too, which had worked every night since I'd been in this place, just all of a sudden refused to work. It was pitch black and raining. My tent at that time was already full of holes from nights spent using it like a sleeping bag on the cement highway shoulders. If you've ever hitched, then you'll understand this. And in the alleyways of Granville too, so it was also soaked on the inside. I remember just feeling so defeated and desperate in that moment that I just sort of sobbed and fell back into my gear with the flaps still slightly askew. It could have been exhaustion, drugs, or accumulated trauma, I don't know, but that night, I swear to you that I heard voices in the forest. Voices and the constant sound of that deep scraping. The voices, if they were speaking a language, I had no idea what it was, but I felt a, an accusatory and angry energy, as if the voices belonged to maybe demonic... I know, that sounds crazy, like something people summoned up that I had messed with. Something in my head convinced me that this was the case and I began to spiral alone in the dark and the rain. 
I didn't sleep that night, obviously. Uh, I wanted to make it to the morning light so that I could make my way out of this place and back to the outskirts. But when morning came, it was raining so hard that I just couldn't leave. And by then I was so tired that I thought that I would rest for a couple of hours and see if the rain would pass. But when I woke up, it was almost dark again. And it was at this time that I really began to panic. I couldn't tell what hour of the day it was because of the clouds and stuff. And I wasn't sure if I wanted to risk hiking back through the muddy animal trail to the outskirts anyway. But I packed up my gear and decided that I would leave the tent as it was basically ruined anyway. I started walking back, but it got dark a lot faster than I thought it would. It was also really difficult because of the rain, and all I had to wear were these terrible black sandals that were super heavy with mud now. And I must have got about 30 minutes from my camp when I heard the scraping sound again, coming from what I perceived to be further up the path. It was at this that... I just completely lost it, freaked out, and began to run back towards my camp. It was dark again by the time that I got back and I could hear the voices again. I zipped up the tent and spent the next few hours shivering in the puddle of water that had accumulated on the bottom of the tent. I was convinced that these voices and sounds were being manifested by my stress, but somehow, while I could convince my mind, I just couldn't convince my body that this was the case. I felt paralyzed and I honestly felt like I was about to die. I must have fallen in and out of sleep though because when I woke up again it was pitch black outside but the rain had stopped and there was just a real eerie sense of a lack of sound. My chest felt clenched like I was having a heart attack but somehow I managed to unzip the tent front and look out. The Coleman lantern miraculously had started working, so I cranked it a bit more and I looked around. And man, it was so quiet. I've never been in such a quiet forest before, in fact. I remember it being so insanely quiet that I started questioning it, in fact. And there was a mist from all the rain as well, and it was just super, super eerie. But it was at this point that I noticed, sitting in front of my tent, was a long, thick log. One end of it was in a pool of water, and I could have sworn that it had stained the ground red with something. I ran, leaving a bunch of stuff behind, for hours, all the way to the highway in the early morning. I really don't remember who found me, but I ended up in the cop shop eventually, and at that point, honestly, it was like walking into heaven. Two days later, I heard about a girl that I knew who was going east, and she offered me a ride. She was running from something too, probably a dude, but I don't know. We did Nanaimo to the prairies in like 24 hours non-stop, including the ferry ride as well. Because at that point, I just wanted to get out of there as fast as I could. When I was 14, I was asked to babysit my three younger cousins, aged 8, 4, and 1, in an extremely rural, mountainous part of Pennsylvania. My aunt and uncle, they had a wedding to go over an hour away and wouldn't be back until very late. Their house was situated on a steep mountainside. Their back deck had like a 15-foot drop onto a rocky hill below, leading down to a river. Their closest neighbors were about a half a mile away, I would guess. The closest main road was like a mile away, and at night there were no lights to be seen anywhere around them. But basically what I'm trying to say is that it was in the middle of nowhere, and you wouldn't have even known that it was there if you weren't, like, going to it, that is. You don't just accidentally end up here, that's for sure. Now, my aunt and uncle left us with some pizza and their cell phone number next to their landline. This was the early 2000s and I didn't have a cell phone, but even if I did, I wouldn't get reception there anyway and headed out. The baby was already asleep. The four-year-old wasn't feeling well and was quietly watching TV in the living room as he dozed off. And the eight-year-old was playing Guitar Hero with me on the loft. The loft overlooked the living room to the left where I could keep an eye on the four-year-old, 
and there was a huge window that overlooked the driveway to the right. Now, this description of the driveway is an important detail to this story. The road that led to their house ran straight into their forked driveway. It was a dead-end road. The house was far off as you could go, pretty much. I go to the left driveway, there's a large open carport, and that's where my aunt and uncle, and anyone who ever visited, parked. The right driveway led down a very short but very steep hill to a large leveled-out area, and ended up against the garage door that opened to the basement of the house. It was never used as a garage, but served as my uncle's man cave and where he spent most of his time. Right beside the garage door, a normal door with a window so that you could see right in was there, but this driveway was exclusively used by the kids as a play area because it was the only flat yard-like area on the property, and being on a mountainside, there isn't much room to safely play otherwise. No cars ever drove down there, ever. There are too many toys and bikes in the way anyway, and friends and family actually knew this. So, it was about 10pm, pitch black outside, no moon to illuminate the area either. My cousin and I were still playing Guitar Hero when headlights caught the corner of my eye. And it wasn't my aunt's minivan headlights. They were huge truck headlights with those roof lights that you often see on Jeeps or other off-road trucks. But not only that, the truck was going down the right driveway, the kids' play area. This was definitely not my aunt and uncle. This was, in fact, not anyone that they knew. Panic and dread began to fill my body at this. I was a teenage girl, alone in an isolated house on a mountain at night with three children in my care. In a terrified voice, I asked my cousin, who is that? Jake, do you know whose truck that is? And then he looked panicked. Uh, no, I've never seen that truck before, he replied. I quickly ushered him downstairs, still unsure what to do, but the two little ones were sleeping down there and I wanted to make sure that they were safe. I checked on the baby and then grabbed the phone to call 911 and then I started to hear the metal garage door being shaken violently. Now, as I said before, no one ever opened that garage door, so more panic began to fill me. I hear them try to open the door beside it, the metal doorknob jiggling. No one was actually knocking. It's not like they were checking to see if my uncle was down there. Plus, the lights were out. It was dark down there. They knew that nobody was down there. They were definitely breaking in. The door leading to the basement steps were right next to the phone, so I could clearly hear all of this going on as well. I quickly turned the little lock on the doorknob just in case they did make it into the basement. My heart was practically jumping out of my chest. I'm talking to the 911 dispatcher at this moment as my 8 year old cousin clings to my arm. The operator is calm and trying to calm me but I knew that it was going to be at least 30 minutes until a police officer could get up there assuming they didn't totally get lost in this mountainside in the pitch dark. But I just kept thinking we're dead. This is how I'm about to die. The operator asked for the number of my aunt and uncle left me so that she could have another dispatcher call them to let them know the situation. I turned around to grab the paper with the number on it and to my absolute horror, I see a man peering in the large sliding glass door. A huge, burly, what had to be at least 6'4 man with a long scraggly red hair and red bushy beard. And what made it even worse was that he was grinning at me. Grinning in a way that still scares me to this day. Meanwhile, I had to have looked like a terrified deer in the headlights. I was shaking so hard that I could barely hold the phone now. There was a second man behind him that I couldn't see as well. I have no idea what he looked like, but he was equally as tall, but a bit more lanky than the larger man at the sliding glass door. I screamed, they're here, and before the 911 operator could say anything, my eight-year-old cousin goes, Mr. Jim? His voice was very confused. It wasn't like my cousin was happy or even relieved to see him. I asked, you know who that is? But before my cousin could answer, I turned my attention to the man in the door and I scream, I'm on the phone with the police. I'm grateful that he didn't try that door because I don't think it was actually locked at the time. But the man stared at me hard for a moment eyebrows furrowed, like deciding what he wanted to do next. But then he just 
backed away into the darkness. What seemed like an eternity later, I saw the truck lights back out of the driveway and then back down the road until they disappeared. I was still scared beyond belief, and so was my cousin. He had only met that guy a few times, an acquaintance of his dad apparently. It wasn't like it was a close family friend or anything, and obviously because, again, he went down the wrong driveway, and visitors never go that way, he didn't know the family very well. The 911 operator asked for a description of the man and told me that they'd gotten in touch with my aunt and uncle and that they were on their way home. She stayed on the phone with me until the police officer showed up a bit later to make sure the men were gone and they stayed with us until my aunt and uncle got home so that they could ask them some questions. Now, my uncle was absolutely furious. Not at me for calling them home early, but at this Mr. Jim guy... He muttered something like, I'm going to mess this guy up. My aunt was mad at my uncle who told him to tell Jim to never come back again. I didn't know at the time, but my uncle actually had a drug problem. I don't know what Mr. Jim or his accomplices were doing, or what would have been done if I wasn't on the phone with the police that night. But the grin, it definitely wasn't a friendly one. It was sinister. And again... He also had to have known my uncle was not there because the basement was dark. He would have seen through the windowed basement door. He had also tried lifting the garage door, something not even my uncle did. In other words, he intended to break into that basement. That much is clear to me. But apart from that, there's no other explanation. I never did babysit for them again and... I don't think I ever went back up there because, not long after that, my aunt divorced my uncle and moved out. This story takes place back in April of 2018. I live on Long Island and was in freshman year of high school. I was going through a, a tough time. Earlier in the week, my girlfriend broke up with me because of rumors that she heard about me, which I won't share here, but there was a lot of drama going around in my life at the time. Depression, broken hearts, you know, typical high school stuff. My mom knew that I was down in the dumps, so one night she took me to get a new phone in the nearby mall. I had an iPhone 5 at the time, going on to an iPhone 8, so I needed a new one. We were gone for about an hour, I would guess. We returned home with my dog greeting us. And let me tell you something about my dog. He's a short, stocky golden retriever who's never violent or vicious in any way. This is important for later as well. My dad was still at work, so it was my duty to take out the trash. I went through the front door with my dog resting on the porch and went to the side of my house to throw out the trash. When I was throwing out the bag, I look over to my neighbor's house where I saw a guy dressed in all black, around six foot, walking out of their side door. Being a paranoid 14 year old, I had a lot of red flags going off. Also, my neighbors and my neighborhood, I live in a safe neighborhood, but not 15 minutes away from walking distance, we live by a town that has high crime rates, ranging from muggings, drug dealings, and even murders from time to time. My neighbors have an older stepson who drag races a lot in the part of the town, so for some stupid reason, I wasn't in flight or fight mode yet because I was assuming that this could be one of his friends. Stupid of me, I know. Until there was another man, and then another one. There were six of these guys, all dressed in black, coming out of the house and from the backyard. It was then that I knew what was going on, so I tried walking away, acting like I saw nothing. When I was on my driveway, I saw two of the guys slowly walking towards me, and my blood instantly went cold. They were getting closer and closer before my dog came bolting off the porch, chasing six men down the street, and my dog came back. I was still standing on my driveway trying to process what I just saw. I went back inside with my mom asking what just happened. I told her what I saw with the six men coming out of the neighbor's house and heading towards me. And at that, she called the police and they came over to ask me questions. I described the six men as best as I could. 
The police told us that we weren't the first to experience this, as there were apparently seven burglaries all over the town at the time, and I probably just witnessed them attempting to break in. I told the officers about two of the six guys walking toward me after I saw them, and they told me that since I saw them, they were trying to, I guess, stop witnesses. And that was basically a friendly way of them saying that the burglars were probably going to kill me since I saw what they were doing. As typical as this could get, the best they could do was a police report. I was always afraid of break-ins, but I never thought that I would ever experience one. To this day, I'm still surprised how my harmless golden retriever probably saved my life that night. And it showed me that no matter where you are in this world, this stuff can happen. The four years have gone by, my family now owns a gun, and I'm currently training in kickboxing for self-defense. I don't know if I'll ever have to use it, but I guess it's better to be safe than sorry. My hometown is pretty small, so small in fact that I ran into this guy on three separate occasions. I remember being eight or maybe nine when this happened. So my younger brother, R and I, we had stayed behind in the previous aisle playing with the small toy section. My mum had immediately called for us to follow her. R and I ran back to the shelf, threw our toys down and ran as fast as we could down the aisle. But we rounded the corner. He rounded it tighter than I did. I was able to keep running on. I, however, ended up running into this tall, big, burly man. He just stared down at me. And even at that age, I remember thinking that he looked like he wasn't completely there. He didn't talk to me, and the look on his face was just weird. In any case, I apologized, and I ran back to my mum. For the rest of the time at the market, I remember constantly seeing him around too. He'd be at either end of the aisle or he would sort of cross the market, always looking my way. And his stare, his stare just made my skin crawl. When we exited the market, he was standing at the door just staring at me. I've had so many nightmares of this market too. I can still remember the cold grey concrete flooring and the exact layout. It terrifies me just thinking about it. I had begged my mum for us to never go there, and I remember either always staying home if she went there, or she would avoid that market if I was with her. But I saw him twice after this. This time, I was 12. So my mum and I had went to a fast food restaurant that was in the shape of an L, except sort of flipped. The shorter part of the restaurant was the cashier part, and the longer was the seating. There were two entrances, one at the end of the sort of straight section and one right in the corner where the flat section meets the straight section. I hope that makes sense. But we had parked and entered at the top of the L. Well, we sat down right near the door and she said that she would go order the food. As she's walking away, I see the door at the other end swing open and in walks the same man from the market. And he looked exactly the same as I remembered in my nightmare. He was headed to the cashier when he turned his head and looked down the aisle. He looked at me and immediately changed course. Now, he was headed straight to me. He took a seat two tables ahead of me. He sat so that well, we were directly facing each other. I grabbed my mum and I told her that I didn't want her to go. I told her that that was the man that I hated so much, the one who had terrified me when I was a little kid. Well, we sat there for a few minutes while she calmed me down and told me that we would just quickly get up and head straight for the car. I remember I looked at her and then I saw his head poke to the side of her, which means that he wanted me to see him. He had that same look on his face too. His eyes were wide open and he looked sort of slack-jawed. After that, we quickly got up and we left that place. The last time that I saw him, I'm not sure what age I was to be honest, maybe around 12 or so, maybe a little bit older, but we had emerged into the freeway as I looked to my left and I see the man is driving. He looked over at me, immediately smiling when he saw my face. 
I told my mum that he was driving next to us and she quickly got off the next turn, drove all around the town so that he wouldn't be able to keep up with us. At the time, I wasn't sure if he was following us, but asking my mum years later, she confirmed that he followed us all around the town for quite some time. I'm glad that I don't really remember much of that, but I think it was because my mum had told me to keep my head down. But I can still see him clear as day. I remember running into him. I remember the fear and the fright that he gave me. I think what scared me the most, though, about him was that he just looked really off. Like there was no line that he wouldn't cross to come and take me. He had no issue staring right into my eyes, in front of other people, letting me know that he, he wanted me. This happened way back in October of 2006. At that time, I was just a 19-year-old kid, always on the lookout for adventure. And one Friday night, after wrapping up my shift at McDonald's, I met up with some friends who suggested that we checked out this haunted location called White's Bridge. My one buddy, Brandon, said that he had recently learned about it and began telling us the legends associated with the 100-year-old wood-covered bridge. Never one to turn down a spooky experience, though. We all piled into my green Ford Taurus and headed out on our journey. Brandon gave directions, guiding me off the main road, and within minutes we were on the dirt back roads surrounded by woods and cornfields. Our only point of reference was a blinking cell tower off in the distance, but we could tell that we were getting further from the city as our cell phones began slowly losing service. As we rode deeper and deeper into what legitimately felt like absolutely middle of nowhere, Brandon repeated the legend associated with the bridge. You see, back in the early 1900s, a local farmer discovered that his beloved wife had been cheating on him, and in a fit of rage, he, well, you get the story. After committing the act, the farmer left his home and wandered the dirt roads in a daze. He eventually came upon White's Bridge, where the realization of what he had done finally began to sink in, and he decided that he would rather not live than face the consequences of his actions. As far as I can tell now, the story is complete fiction, but at the time, we totally believed it. So after a long and bumpy ride, Brendan instructed me to turn right on an off-road. I wouldn't have even noticed was there, to be honest, had he not pointed it out. I took the turn, and there before us was White's Bridge. It looked like something straight out of a horror film, if I'm being honest. An old wood-covered bridge, aged by time, sitting alone above a river deep in the middle of nowhere. We parked the car on the side of the road and we got out to explore. Immediately catching our eyes, though, was a scarecrow lying abandoned at the entrance to the bridge. My friend Mike, who was known as somewhat of a risk taker and a stupid one at that, picked up the scarecrow and then lit it on fire of all things. The hay body burst up into a ball of flames and Mike waved it around proudly next to the old dry wood bridge. Quickly realizing the risk too, I told him to throw the stupid thing into the river and put it out, which thankfully he did. After making sure that there weren't any rogue embers that could ignite the bridge, Brandon suggested that we get back into the car and pull it onto the bridge. He explained that the legend was that if you parked your car in the middle of the bridge, put it into neutral, and then shut off the engine, the spirit of the dead farmer would push the vehicle forward to get it off the bridge. So naturally, we had to try this. We piled back in and did exactly as he said. We parked halfway across the rickety old bridge and killed the engine. We sat in the pitch black, saying nothing, waiting for something, anything to happen. The only sounds were the creaking of the bridge, the river flowing beneath us, and then footsteps. Suddenly, the back driver's door side opens and a woman abruptly enters the back seat, cramming in next to my two friends back there. She looked to be in her late 20s, early 30s, long straight black hair, slim and wearing a red plate shirt and blue jeans. I saw your fire signal for me, she said. Uh, what? Wait. I replied, totally freaked out and at a complete loss for words, to be honest. I'm so glad you came. My boyfriend's car broke down, down that way. 
I need a ride back. My brain was doing its best to compute the situation. Uh, what? Uh, what? I'm sorry, but who are you? I asked. What are you doing out here? I told you, she responded curtly. My boyfriend's car broke down over there. Can you please just give me a ride so I don't have to walk all the way back? She was pointed ahead towards a narrow road that forked off to the right on the other side of the bridge. My friend Mike, the scarecrow burner, and ever the gentleman added, I mean, if you need a place to stay, you're more than welcome to come crash at my place. I got plenty of drink and I interrupted him. No lady, listen, I'm sorry, I don't know who you are. You just got in my car and this is all really weird. You could be an axe murderer for all I know and... I'm sorry, you've got to get out, alright? She glared at me in the rearview mirror. And if looks could kill, I would have been done for. But you signaled for me, she responded in an irritated tone. We weren't signaling for you, alright? Just get out. She let out an angry sigh and got out, walking back in the direction from which she came and disappearing into the night. I started the engine right up and looked at my friends, and they all had looks of disbelief on their face. Without saying a word, I put the car in drive and slowly rolled forward and off the bridge. But we needed to turn around and go back across the bridge to get back to where we had come from. And the only way to do that was to pull onto the side road that the woman said her boyfriend's car had broken down on and then reverse. As I pulled onto the side road, my headlights illuminated the three posted signs that I hadn't been able to see from the bridge. No trespassing, private property, and do not enter. And looking up the road, there was suddenly no sign of the woman anywhere. And quite honestly, it was as if she just had literally vanished. I didn't want to stick around, so I backed up and crossed the bridge again. And from there began the journey home. But we really didn't have much to say on the ride home, to be honest. I think we all just were equally stunned. Except for Mike, who asked if he knew anyone that would be awake at this hour that he could score some weed from. I visited White's Bridge a couple of times after that, but nothing of note ever happened in my subsequent visits. Sadly, some delinquents burned down the old White's Bridge some years ago. It was rebuilt, but from what I hear, it's just not the same as the original. I don't have any plans to go back and check it out, but it was an interesting experience to say the least. For the past four years, I've worked as a funeral director in Embama at two different locations in separate buildings. In my line of work, of course, the nature of the work would be unsettling to most, I suppose you could say, especially the aspect of the tasks completed on the descendants themselves. As an Embama, I've performed some gruesome actions, all for the betterment of someone's loved one's appearance and their expectations during the viewing, during their visitation period. But I'm telling you all of this to set the stage that I'm definitely not scared easily from the unsettling and I've had a rock-solid stomach that could handle any smell or sight that we come across that any embalmer will see at some point. As there are two locations, though, that I frequently visited for my work, I'll label them one and two just for simplicity's sake. So, the first location. Coming back from a death call at a hospital at 2am into a 130-year-old funeral home with a descendant in the back of the van seems creepy enough to most, but it's the reality that most people don't realise is a fairly common occurrence. My first major encounter happened sometime after I arrived to the funeral home and starting my normal embalming procedures. During the procedures, of course, I'm not paying extreme attention to my surroundings of the room, but I had noticed just a sort of nausea of chill that wasn't normal, as I'd embalmed many times before and never noticed anything like this. I just shrugged it off, though, and continued on. But after I had completed, I walked into a casket showroom, which is directly next to the embalming room, and flipped on the lights... And in the corner, next to the end of two caskets, was what I can only describe as a black mist that seemed to sort of dissipate into the corner of the room. 
plain as day. In the fully lit room, I was absolutely rocked by this realization that me and this descendant were not alone in the funeral home. Someone or something had been watching me the entire time. The second occurrence was when I was leaving one night around 11pm after a long day of death calls and funerals. Every evening when we leave we would go from room to room and make sure every light is off to save on the electric bill. I had sat down in my car and looked up into one of the rooms on the second level and I had noticed that I had left a lamp on. I decided to not go back in and get it in the morning. No big deal, right? Yeah, I wish. The specific room was the location manager's office and it looked as if the light was emanating from the middle of the room. Just some context too, the lamp in question was originally owned by the location manager's wife who had passed and also went through the same funeral home that we worked at. He had brought it from home to use there in his office because it was no longer needed at his house. And that next day I went up there to check on the room and turn the lamp off. The only problem was that the lamp emanating the light the night before was sitting in the middle of his desk, not even plugged in. I was the first employee there that morning and no one had been there during the night for any reason at all. Also, when seeing the lamp on the night before, I know the funeral home was empty because I was the last person to leave. Now, these two occurrences aren't alone, but they are probably some of the most notable, because I guess I just can't really explain them away. But there are several hundred times that I felt watched or something seems to move in the corner of my eye. There's also been many times when I hear someone whisper hello or pay in my ear. There are so many that it's hard to keep when or how they happen straight, to be honest, but I guess that that's just the baggage with the job. The second location though, at this location I actually lived in the top funeral home for a period of like 6-8 to eight months. It was because it was free room and board in a fully furnished apartment and the ease of being able to just wake up and clock in in the morning without even having to drive anywhere is a luxury that most people don't think about. But the first happening was subtle but not a completely subtle moment I suppose. A few weeks into my initial move into the apartment upstairs of the funeral home, I was sleeping in my room upstairs and was awoken by the sounds of the stairs creaking as if someone was walking up them. It was 1am and I knew that no one was there but me. Because usually when a death call happens I know about them because I'm called by my answering service to go and get them, I was sure that I was the only one there. At this point I'm frozen in place like who the heck would be there at this time of night without me knowing about it. All of the doors are locked to the funeral home and so is my bedroom door. The freezing continues though until whatever it is outside my door comes to it and knocks on it twice. I say nothing but after several moments of complete silence the creaking starts again but back down the stairwell. I sat totally still the rest of the night, I couldn't sleep at all. Thankfully nothing else happened but I was absolutely rattled by that experience. Whatever that was knew that I was up there. I didn't like that thought at all too but I had no other choice but to continue to live there because my financial position at the time I couldn't really afford anything else. My second experience there was in the evening as well. I was eating a TV dinner in my kitchen there in the apartment. I looked up from my food and watched a doorknob turn and the door opened as if someone just walked through and shut it back. I just sat there mouth agape and was totally flabbergasted. I was also there alone that night as well. There were no breezes or change in air pressure or anything that could account for the door's closure. I don't know what happened that night but finally and the most recent... Uh, yesterday I was sitting on the couch downstairs on break during the middle of the day. I was alone again. If there's nothing going on as far as funerals or arrangement conferences on the weekends, we keep the doors locked and the lights off. I rose from the couch and was walking into the main hall of the funeral home and I noticed a man standing in the doors to the funeral chapel and I said aloud, Hey, you! 
he didn't turn or say anything. He just walked away from me and turned the corner. I followed him into the chapel to try and get his attention. I rounded that same corner and, and I did. I found absolutely nothing. By this time, I was freaking out. The man was wearing a navy blue sort of pinstripe suit with a white collared button up, grey slicked back hair and was about the same height as me I think. He was an older fellow and was a little hunched over in the back. For reference, I'm 6'2". I immediately called the manager of the funeral home though, same as the other location, and told him what had happened and described this man. And he told me that... I had probably seen his old manager, who also lived in the apartment that I did currently several years ago. And it was at that moment that everything began to make some sense. For reference, we live in a state infamous for human trafficking and the event took place around 2am. So my friend and I, both females, were driving down a road in the middle of nowhere, just to talk and clear our minds. And you know those roads out in the desert that stretch for miles with no lights that get pitch black and a little bit spooky at night too? Well, it was one of those. But we were already a little bit paranoid given that we were both small females late at night in the middle of nowhere. If anything were to happen, no one would be around to see it. And after probably 15 minutes of driving out into this area, without passing a single vehicle, a black either very large truck or SUV, I can't really remember despite it only being a couple of days ago, comes up in the distance. But they had their high beams on, so they would have seen that we were two females alone passing us. And immediately after passing us, they pull off and stop for a second, which alarmed us a bit, and then pulled a U-turn, driving in our direction, which obviously alarmed us a little bit more. The street was just a, a long stretch of straight road continuing for miles, which means that there was no logical reason for them to have turned around like that. But based on the layout of the land, this is not the kind of place that you can make a wrong direction in, but regardless, if you're suspicious, it gets worse. So they speed up until they're directly behind us, blinding us with their lights, which scared us even more. And the next event made our stomachs drop and our breathing stop. They turned their lights off. We couldn't see them anymore, aside from the brief shadow of a vehicle if I really, really squinted into the dark. And to say that we were terrified was an understatement. All of the worst case scenarios were playing out in our heads. We had never been in this area before and we were now alone. But we didn't want to call the cops as they were notoriously unreliable. But we were in the middle of nowhere and we also had weed in the car. Despite this though, we felt safe knowing, despite unreliable, that we were in a vehicle. And as long as we didn't stop or get out, we should be safe. And so we did for 30 minutes but what felt like a lot longer than that this vehicle followed us with the lights off and we never passed a single other vehicle on the road in fact after driving back into civilization finding a route that had no u-turns required despite how much longer it would take the vehicle got off once there were street lights and buildings in sight Last week I was at home watching a movie. I was reclined in my chair which faces a window that faces another building with a small amount of grass between them. I live in a basement apartment so the windows are at ground level. They're about 2 feet tall and 3 feet wide. So I doze off and fall into a deep sleep. My dog is sleeping on my lap. I'll mention that my dog barks at any animal or wind rustling leaves outside this window. No people ever walk by it, given its location, but occasionally a bird will come by it or something like that. I wake up abruptly from my sleep with an intense alertness. My eyes open wide quickly, like a sort of instinctual response. I remember immediately feeling like I was being watched. Simultaneously, I look straight at the window and I'm staring right at this face. Our eyes are locked on each other. 
I remember feeling nothing but extreme alertness and fear at this point, but also very calm, weirdly. I had this absolute knowing that it had been watching me sleep for a while. It felt more curious than threatening, I suppose. But whatever it was, it was bizarre to say the least, and I just felt like I couldn't move, like I was hypnotized. Anyway, we stare at each other for like a solid 20 or so seconds. I'm just lying there, still unblinking. My mind was shifting through possibilities to rationalize logically what it could be. I wanted so badly to believe that it was just an animal, but its face was bare of fur with sort of human-colored skin. It was very small, no way it could have been human. It had to be the size of like a one-year-old child, if that, by the size of its face. I couldn't see its body because it was dark outside, but my apartment was lit by my Christmas lights, and it looked like it was leaned in on its arms with its face as close to the window as possible. But what was particularly strange to me is that my dog wasn't barking. He just lied there, still with me. This is when I think, too, that I might have been having, like, sleep paralysis or something. I have sleep paralysis quite often, and this didn't feel like it. It felt more like a, a trance state. I felt connected to it somehow. I finally get the nerve to sit up and take a closer look and mumble, What the... And that's when it backs away. I remember my thought process being in slow motion and clear. I tell myself to listen closely to see if I can hear four legs or two. It just gets up and runs away. And this is when my dog finally starts barking. That was when I knew for sure as well that I wasn't imagining it. I mean, I hear it run distinctly on two feet. It sounded really small, whatever it was. I could tell by the sound of its sort of gating walk that it was very small. And in the end, I just sat there confused. My dog going crazy. I check the time and it's 4.47 in the morning. And guys, I have no idea what to think. It does correlate with one thing though. You see, in late August, I started building a shrine or a temple type thing out in the woods at a large nature park. It was my favorite spot to go and meditate or practice my harmonica or write. It became an encompassing sort of spiritual ritual, I guess you could say, to go out there. The whole thing was a meditation type practice, and it's basically a big teepee made from dead tree trunks and branches with a stacked stick circle inside of it. I had worked tirelessly out there, being in a kind of union with nature in my mind as I built it. I meditated and carried the meditation out with action. I remember one night too at like 1am, a friend and I were sitting out there. We were in the middle of a conversation when my friend's face turns into a sort of panic worry. I stop talking and can hear footsteps coming towards us. It was already loud and distinct enough, as if close to us I think but we sat and listened for a long time as it kept walking closer, but never actually got to us, which was weird. We decided to leave though, and she really doesn't like talking about it because of the feeling of the energy and air as we acknowledged it. Anyways, someone totally destroyed my shrine in October, and I just left it as it is. It sort of crushed me a bit, and I would often visit the ruins a bit heartbroken. But to wrap this tangent up, the day that this happened, the creature watching me sleep that is, was the same day that I went out there and suddenly felt a strong urge to rebuild it. I cleared everything and started again and after a few hours I came home and fell asleep. And then all of this happened. I don't know if any of it means anything but what do you guys think? This happened when I was about 14 or 15. I'm 19 now. I was in my house's basement playing PlayStation absentmindedly late into the night like I did often at the time. Being up till like 3 or 4 in the morning was not unusual for me at this time. How my house is structured too is that it has a front door but also a second set of front doors if you go down the driveway. The basement is by these second doors too. 
So, as I was getting ready to log off for the night, I heard my dog started going crazy from upstairs. They sometimes bark at nothing, a car passing in the night or too much wind whipping past their window or something. However, as someone who listened to too many scary stories, that was more than enough for me to go and check it out. So I went upstairs and was about to go straight to my room when I caught a glimpse of movement out of the window. I looked through my window to the front yard, but I couldn't see anything. And suddenly I heard my dad yell in a voice lower than his own, Hey, can I help you? This is what set me into pure adrenaline mode. I stood frozen, staring out of the window as my ears strained to hear the guy's response. I still got nothing before my dad continued, Sorry, you have the wrong house, get off the property. And it was at this point that whoever this person was comes into sightline. It was a man wearing a white sleeveless shirt and cargo pants and I watched as he walked off our front path and onto the street and then back onto the path and he was seemingly unsure of where to go or what to do I think. It was at this point that I realized with utter dread I didn't lock the downstairs front door. I finally break my frozen spell and run back down the stairs and lock the front door. I take a deep breath and start back towards the stairs when I hear it. The door handle jiggling. I don't even look back. I just book it up the stairs and into my parents' room. My dad had already called the cops. They came about a half an hour later and seemingly picked up the guy from an empty house down the street that was in the process of being sold. And the following day when my dad was checking the newspaper, it told of an escaped convict from the max security prison here. Some sort of mix-up was made and they let the wrong person out apparently. They caught him luckily enough but didn't detail where. But it was obvious based on some of the information within the article that this was the dude that we saw that night. And that is how I both forgot and remembered my way through a very creepy experience. As a child, I think kindergarten age, I loved to talk. If anyone had a question for me, I would gleefully give them way too much information. But most people found it endearing and would praise me for being so smart, which often encouraged me a lot. But some people found it annoying, obviously. Now, my mum and I normally shopped at the market just a few minutes away from our house. My mum had been shopping there for like 20 some years at that point, and was friends with most of the workers there. So I was friendly with them too and always was happy to talk with them. But whenever my mum got distracted talking to someone, I, with the intention span of a six-year-old, would wander around the aisles just looking at things. My mum would keep an eye on me to make sure that I didn't go too far, but if she was distracted, one of the employees would usually be around and gently guide me back over. One day though, we went to a different market that I couldn't remember having been to before. And we didn't go back for nearly a decade, mind you. We were walking around the aisles when my mum ran into a friend. And they started talking and I, not realising that I no longer had a store full of adults, keeping an eye on me that is, started wandering around the aisles. My eyes caught some colourful display, I think flowers or balloons or something, and I went over to look. Once I was satisfied with my inspection, I turned back to the aisle, only to find that my mum wasn't there. Huh, that had never happened before. I looked around a little, though not moving from my spot near the colourful displays. Since it was right near the registers, there was a decent amount of people nearby, which I'm thankful for now. But as I was looking around, an employee came up to me. He was older than my sister, she was 12 or 13 at the time, and younger than my dad in his mid-40s, which was about the only way that I could gauge the age. But nowadays I would say that he was probably in his early to mid-20s if I remember it correctly. Hi there, he said sweetly in that tone that you normally speak to kids in. I cheerfully said hello, actually stepping a little closer. Hey, are you looking for your mum? I say yes, happily explaining that I had last seen her talking to a friend and that I could normally find her easily when I wandered away, so I wasn't sure where she could have gone. 
Does she leave you alone often? Not really. My older sister was normally with me if my mum wasn't. She was 12 or 13 and she was super mature, so if my mum had to leave me for a little bit, she knew that I would be okay. Plus, she never really left us alone in public, just at home if she needed to run somewhere. Never for very long too, just the length of time for a Pokemon episode or something. And my dad was at work a lot and didn't come back home until late, usually anyway. Just if you guys were wondering. But then he said, where do you live? And well, wouldn't you know it, I had just learned my address. We just learned how to mail a letter in school, even took a little class trip to the mailbox in our school corner to send them out. I knew how to write my address now, and I knew how to say it, and want to hear? Of course you do. I know kids are naive, but I was downright dumb at this age. I was diagnosed with colorblindness two years later, otherwise known as red-green colorblindness. It makes sense, as I was totally blind to all the red flags, too. So, where do you go to school, and who picks you up? Well, I go to the local elementary school. I don't know the address, though. Sorry, I tell him. But I know what street it's on, because I wait on the sidewalk for my mum or daycare sitter, depending on the day, so I see the street sign a lot, since I'm usually waiting for a while to be grabbed. Hey, do you like animals? Like puppies? The dog scare me. Cats scare me, pigeons scare me, fish scare me, flies scare me. You know what doesn't scare me though? Turtles. I have five turtles. No dogs that might bark or bite if somebody drops by the house, like our neighbor does. Those dogs are always behind the gate though, so they don't scare me that much. But at this stage, it had only been a few minutes since I last saw my mum, even with how much information I was dumping. I was a very fast talker. But I was starting to get a little bit antsy. Not because I was uncomfortable talking to a stranger, but because I had skipped lunch that day, specifically to con my mum into letting me get a bagel from the store next door, which was exactly why we were at the market in the first place. My mum was holding onto the bagel to make sure I didn't try to eat it too fast and choke, which I had done several times in the past. And quite frankly, I just wanted my bagel. And while I liked to talk to this grown man who made me feel smart and was oh so interested in my life, I liked bagels a lot more. Plus, if I caught my mum when we were near the bakery section, I might be able to use my charm and cuteness to get a cookie. So I gotta find my mum now. Oh, uh, well, how about I walk around with you and help you find her? You wanna lead me through the market that you work at where you can easily bring me to the back room, the meat locker, or any number of places? Yeah, sure, sounds good, I thought. Ozzy! I look around to see my mum, the relieved look on her face slowly changing into something more anxious. I smile happily and I wave her over. She immediately grabs my hand, and I can tell that she wants to chide me, probably for leaving the aisle, but... She seems more occupied on the man in front of me. Before I can even open my mouth to introduce him, or remember that I never actually got his name, he quickly says that he's glad that I found my mum and he needs to get back to work, and practically runs to the back of the store. My mum puts her hands on my shoulders and looks me in the eye, her expression a lot more worried now. What was he talking about to you? She asked, her voice more serious than I had ever heard. Can I have my bagel? My mum opens her mouth, pauses, and goes into her purse to hand me my bagel. But between bites, I happily tell her about the conversation and everything that I remembered. My age and grade, the pickup schedule, likes and dislikes, my literal address. And my mum gradually became paler, then became red with anger. She brought me over to the manager and... I don't really remember much about the conversation, but I got a cookie. I remember that pretty well because it was shaped like a watermelon, which was apparently far more important to me than paying attention to what was being said. I do remember, though, that the police weren't called. We went home, and my mum told me that I wasn't allowed to walk around the store anymore like that. No more talking to any strangers, even if they worked at the store that we were at, unless she was with me, that was. If I ever was to see that man again, I was to run away, find someone that I know, and ask for help. And if all else fails, scream at the top of my lungs, just like when a fly lands on me. 
By the way, I still hate insects. I agree pleasantly, not really phased by anything that she's saying. I know that some people are bad, of course, but the bad people look bad, right? They talk mean and look scary and try to grab you. This man, he didn't, so he wasn't bad to me. But if my mum was saying it, then I guess I had no choice but to listen. And I better enjoy that cookie because we apparently weren't going back to that store ever again. Tears incoming. In exchange, though, I can get a donut once a month from our usual store. Tears cancelled. When I was around 12, our school had a safety assembly and was talking about the shady things that adults do to get close to kids, and a very, very watered down version of what they most likely wanted. And I'm sitting there listening, and suddenly realize oh, if my mum hadn't have found me, Something really terrible might have happened. If not in the store, then in front of my school. And if not in front of my school, then perhaps even at my house. A little over a decade now. I'm 18 now, and I've never seen the guy again. Not even at that store, which is odd, because we went back there a couple of times, and I don't think he actually worked there. This happened about a year ago and there were just so many terrible factors working against me that night that I'm honestly astounded that I got away unscathed, at least physically that is. This all begins when I'm at my friend's apartment who lives in a really rough part of town. In a series of poor decisions, that night I decided to get belligerently drunk and take a few pills of who knows what. And yes, I, I know, I know. Safe to say, though, that after a solid night of partying, around 4am, I was definitely not in the right state of mind. My drug addled brain decides that instead of staying that night at my friend's apartment like I normally would, I wanted to Uber back to my own apartment instead. My friend's apartment had two separate entrances or exits to the building, one in the back unlit parking lot of the building and one facing the street. They had two sets of keys for each door and I only had keys to one in the back of the apartment. Since my Uber would obviously arrive at the street and the door in the front of the building locks itself behind you, I exited this way when the driver was soon to arrive. Looking back, standing outside that apartment, I realized that I must have looked like the easiest target on the planet. I'm a small petite female in my early 20s and I can hardly stay upright. I'm using a street lamp to prop myself up and not doing a good job at that either. The light was basically a beacon for any nearby predators, saying come and get me. I'm not paying attention to any of my surroundings at all in this state, despite the fact that there was literally a bullet hole in the front door that I came out of, which is not good. I do remember checking to see what car I was getting picked up in and was only able to pick out the fact that it was a black sedan. Soon after stepping outside, a black sedan pulls up to the curb and starts rolling down the window, so step forward. Now, before this man even spoke, I could feel that something was just wrong. He had an expression like he was tearing me apart with just his eyes, and after seeing that look, it gave me a new meaning to the word predator to describe a criminal because I then knew what it felt like to be prey. He basically barks at me, I'm your Uber driver. This was the second red flag that somehow made its way through my brain. Normally Uber drivers just roll down their window and they say your name, but I think I just stared at him for a second, my brain slowly piecing together the situation that I was potentially in, and I ask him, what's my name? He immediately is enraged and starts screaming about how he doesn't have time for this and just get in the car, etc, etc. Quite honestly, I don't think that I've ever sobered up so fast in my life before. I'm completely panicking. Obviously, this wasn't my Uber. Quickly checking the license plate, I immediately see that it's not a match. But meanwhile, this guy is still screaming at me and I have absolutely no idea what to do. If I bolt in either direction, this guy could easily outrun me or have a weapon or something. I'm also pretty sure at this point that if he's trying to nab a random girl off the street, he must have a weapon of some sort. I can't run back into the apartment door right behind me since it locks right behind you. 
and I don't have the keys, nor time to unlock it. Running towards the back door would do nothing as well, as he's idling right by the mouth of the driveway towards the back parking lot, and again, I would have to take the time to find the right keys and get in. If I screamed, I'm not exactly in the right type of neighborhood where someone would try to be a vigilante, and I can still hear the music radiating from my friend's third floor apartment, and I just knew that they weren't about to hear me. Also, it's four in the morning and absolutely nobody is around. People talk a lot about these sorts of situations where they either sprint into action or they freeze, but I felt incapable of doing either one of those things. It was the absolute worst feeling that I've ever felt in my life, though. Everything in me wanted to run, but I felt that if I did, that it was going to be the end of me. But if I kept standing there, staring in shock at this screaming man, the result would be the same. From when he started screaming at me up until this point, I'm guessing it was only about 20 seconds that had passed. And just as he's looking like he's getting ready to get out of the car, another black sedan pulls up right behind him. Checking the license plate as quickly as I can, I realize that it's my actual Uber and I make a full sprint to the car, at really only like six steps, and throw myself in, screaming at my real Uber driver, what's my name? The poor dude looks terrified, but responds with my name quickly, to which I reply, get me out of here, this man is trying to kidnap me. If I was in this Uber driver's position, I think I would have been too shocked to react as quickly as he did, but my dude, he flew out of there, offered to call the cops for me, which I declined, and now regret too, and then walked me to the front door of my apartment, ensuring that I got inside safely. A truly an incredible human being. You can rest easy too, knowing that he got the fattest tip my college student bank account would allow for, although he deserved much, much more than that. I'm very confident in saying that I think that man, he may have just saved my life that night. This happened back in September of 2019 when I was 15. Just to set the scene as well, my kitchen and dining room, they're connected with the kitchen window facing out to the front garden with no trees or plants in them. This will be important later. So a couple of weeks prior to the main event, I came downstairs to get some cereal at around 10pm. I was pouring the cereal when I heard one faint light tap against the window. I stopped and took a minute to think about what I just heard and whether it was in my head or if someone had actually just tapped on the window. However, I wasn't going to open the blinds to find out because, well, I believe in ghosts and I'm scared of dark places. Plus, there could have been somebody out there, so... I was pretty much just out of there. I did forget about what happened until a few weeks later, early September, when I was coincidentally going down late at night, maybe 1am I think, to get some cereal again, but as I was getting everything out, I heard one solid tap on the window, then another and another one, but weirdly in a sort of regular pattern, and the tap sounded like somebody's finger was tapping on the glass, which made it even creepier, obviously. The part that sent chills down my spine this time was the fact that the blinds were open, so I didn't want to look outside. I quickly just sped walked up the stairs like there was no tomorrow, and I knocked on my mum's door to tell her what had happened. Obviously, she was asleep, but I was crapping bricks, so it was always comforting to speak about things with her. But as I walked into her room, the light from the hallway faintly filled the room where I saw this huge shadow hovering above my mum's bed. This all happened within about two seconds, but it appeared to flutter some wings or something, and then it just dove straight towards me. I closed my eyes out of fear of what I just saw, and I don't really remember much for the next two minute period, so this is all according to my mum, but apparently I just stood there hyperventilating with my eyes sealed shut. It took me a solid minute to calm my breathing down to a normal pace where I then finally came to, and just decided to call it a night. Safe to say that I laid in my bed that night with the lights on and it was a, a very sleepless night.
This happened a week ago, and my blood still runs cold when I think about it. So my brother wanted to get a drink from a place that we both loved to go to. It was going to close soon, and he had work to do, so I went by myself. It wasn't very late, but it was already dark, and my parents had drummed into me since birth about the dangers of walking alone at night. I was kind of nervous that day, I'll admit, even though I've done it many times before. But I went and got both drinks, and for some reason I forgot to bring it back. I was walking along with both hands full, bad idea mind you. As I was walking towards the street where my house was, I suddenly became aware of two men very near me. One was in front of me wearing a maroon pullover, and the other was behind me wearing a grey zipped up hoodie with the hood pulled up. I only really turned around for a flash of a second, so I couldn't describe his face to you. I was weirded out though because I was walking between them and I was beginning to feel uncomfortable like they were trying to hurt me or something. And just as I was telling myself that I was clearly overreacting, I came across a garage that was down an alleyway and black Subaru was coming out of it. I had time, so I crossed before they reached me. The person inside clearly wasn't counting on me doing that, so they sort of swung around and parallel parked next to me, at most only two feet away. So now I was between three men and a wall. When I saw that door open, that was it for me. I just bolted and I didn't stop running until I reached my house. This happened about uh, maybe 11 months ago when me and my wife got married in June. I will never be so grateful that I have a habit of locking doors. So our wedding day was coming to an end. Family and friends were slowly starting to depart as me and my wife Diana took pictures and chatted with some of the guests who stayed a little longer and were just having a good time. It was a great day too and a lot of fond memories were made but what was least expected is... What happened that night is we were on our way to our honeymoon. As me and Diana said goodbye to the last of the guests, 9pm, we got in the car and we headed home. We had our bags packed prior to the wedding day for Cancun and we were ready to go. I live in WA and we were in a bit of a hurry because instead of flying out from the Seattle airport in SeaTac, like normal people do, it was a lot cheaper for us to drive up north to Canada and fly out from the Canadian airport. Also, me and my wife thought that it'd be fun to have a sort of little road trip to Canada and then fly out from Canada to Cancun. Plus, it was only a three and a half hour drive for us and cheaper too, so we headed out, 12am. We had a great time too, just driving and blasting music, talking about Cancun and just being excited about the new next chapter in our lives. Diana slowly started to fall asleep, being exhausted from the wedding and whatnot. We were halfway to Canada. At this point too, we were no longer in the city area, but more uh, a wooded area with fewer cars and fewer people the more that we drove, practically seeing no one on the road. By that time, it was around 3am. We had some extra time on our hands and I was starting to fall asleep too, so I just sort of pulled over to a gas station to get some Red Bull to keep me awake and whatnot. I pulled into the gas station that was completely empty and parked the car to see Diana asleep. I told her that I'm taking the keys and that I would lock her inside and that I would be right back. I'm not sure if she could hear me, but she kind of motioned her hand around like people normally do when they're just too tired to care. I came back around six minutes later to find my wife shaking and crying. I was confused and freaking out a bit because I wasn't sure why she was crying. She couldn't even get words out at first. But later, once she calmed down, she told me this. So apparently, she did hear me when I told her that I'd take the keys and be right back. And as she was sleeping, she was woken by a tapping on the driver's side window. Being too tired to get up though, or even open her eyes, she lazily went for the unlock button on the passenger side of the door, assuming that it was me. As she was going for it though, she just sort of froze and a thought passed her mind. Then she remembered, didn't he say that he had his keys? Why would he need me to unlock the door for him? That's when she heard a woman's voice mumbling from the driver's side. She turned herself around to look at the window and she saw a woman. 
long black hair with wide eyes and a sort of crooked smile on her face. She couldn't really hear what she was saying at first, but then as she listened closely, she could hear it. She kept repeating in a sort of mumbled tone, Are you tired? Just over and over. She really freaked out and told the woman to just leave her alone. The woman allegedly laughed and told my wife that she was tired too. The woman never took her eyes off of her and tried the door handle at one point. At this point too, my wife was close to tears and attempted to call me, but as she did, she heard what sounded like a phone buzz and realized that I had left my phone in the car. Out of options now, my wife started to honk the horn trying to scare off the woman while also maybe getting my attention. The woman still had her gaze on her and started mumbling more while laughing and trying the door handle again. Then she mentioned something about someone named Sarah and asked my wife if she knew her. After a few more minutes of this mumbling, she eventually left and to my wife's word, the minute that she left, I came out of the gas station. So my wife broke down. I still don't know how I didn't hear the honking of the car and... I still feel bad for leaving my phone in the car like that. My wife has also added that one of the creepier things about that woman is that she didn't look homeless or dirty or anything. In fact, she looked completely normal and well kept. My wife said that she'll never forget the woman's white eyes and the gaze that she had on her with that smile. It also chills me to think what would have happened if my wife never realized that I had the keys or if she never had heard me about locking her inside and open the door while face the other way or something. I don't know what those women's intentions were, but if I couldn't hear the honk of the horn, then I'm definitely sure that there's no way that I would have heard screams. So basically, I've lived in this house for most of my life now. It's small and in a quiet neighborhood. Nothing out of the ordinary ever really happens here. But lately, over the past year, I've just had some weird experiences. I'll share three main ones that really shake me whenever I think about them. So, the first one happened about six months ago. I usually get home from school around 4.30ish because I have swim practice when school ends. My mum usually gets home at around 6, and almost every day, I follow the same routine. Get home, eat a snack, watch a bit of TV, do some homework on the couch, and that's about it. Today was pretty much no different, and as soon as I got my snack, I sat down on the couch and began to watch some TV. After about an hour of watching TV, I started to feel super groggy out of nowhere and could barely keep my eyes open. I woke up about 30 minutes later to my mum shaking me, telling me to open all of the windows. Apparently, when she got home, the carbon monoxide alarm was going off, so she checked the heater in the kitchen. When she walked into the kitchen, all of the stove burners were turned on to where there was no fire, but gas was just leaking out everywhere. She blamed it on me, but I specifically remember not using the stove, and if I did... Why would I turn on all of the burners anyway? That was the first encounter too that made me feel like something was off in this house. The second encounter happened a few months after the first. My mum and I were building a dresser from Ikea and well, we needed a screwdriver. We always keep a bag of house tools in the hall closet and more outside of the garage. She sent me to go and get some tools from the tool bag in the hall closet. But when I got there, there was no screwdrivers in there. Like, none. No flathead or star ones, no small or large or any. All of the rest of the tools were there though, so I told her and she said that that was weird, but to go and check in the garage. I went into the garage and once again there were absolutely no screwdrivers. And I was like, what the heck is going on? Anyways... I went back inside and I told my mum, and of course she was like, oh, I guess I'll have to go and get them myself. So we both checked the hall closet, none were there. The garage, again, none were there. Coming back into the house, we stopped in the kitchen and talked about how weird that was, because we hardly ever used the tools, so where could they have gone? We walked down the hall into the living room, and 
both of us immediately gasp because in the middle of the carpet is a pile of 10 to 15 screwdrivers just sitting there. We both looked at each other out of confusion and I also think uh, a little bit of fear. This third one happened about a week ago and is honestly the scariest one. It gives me goosebumps just talking about it in fact. But one night uh, I was sitting at my computer watching YouTube it was a little bit late, around 2 or 3 in the morning, I think. I always leave the hall light on with my door shut because I'm afraid of the dark, and it gives me just a little bit of light. So I'm watching YouTube, and I kept hearing my mum walking from her room to the living room, which is weird because I remember her going to bed a couple of hours ago, and she's a really heavy sleeper who doesn't wake up for pretty much anything, so I called out to her, but nobody answered. So I was like... Well, that's weird. And then I heard the footsteps again, so I looked under the door and I could have sworn that I saw like a, a shadow of feet standing there and I thought it was my mum, so I was like, why doesn't she open the door? So I got up and opened the door, but when I did, there was nobody there. I went into my mum's room and she was dead asleep like snoring and everything and I was immediately creeped out so I woke her up and was like why do you keep walking down the hall and she was like what I've been asleep since like 11. In the end I just sort of brushed it off as just my imagination so I went back into my room and sat down at my computer and watched my show for like another 20 more minutes but then I hear a click of the light switch out in the hall I looked under the door and it was pitch black and I was like, what? So I opened my door and the light was off. And I know that I left it on because, well, I always do. So I woke my mum up again and was like, did you turn the light off? And she was like, no. And so I was even more creeped out and I ended up sleeping with my room lights on after that. Now, there's a lot of other small things that have happened in my house too like sometimes doors will open on their own or I can hear something walking around and stuff moving at night I always feel like I'm being watched as well or that there's something here with me and the whole vibe of our house just feels off and really scary I don't know what changed or how this happened but if anyone has any ideas then please comment or give me some advice or something I've tried using sage, by the way, to clean the house of negative energy because I heard that that can work, but that just hasn't seemed to do anything. I just really don't know anything about any of this stuff, and I feel like I'm just way out of my depth. About a year ago, I was living with my mate. I stayed in a ground floor flat that kind of sits in a cul-de-sac, and is a bit of a pain to walk to, I'll admit. A kind of detached from the community. The only times I ever felt completely secure are during sunlight, depending on the time of year. The block of flats is kind of an L shape. Our entrance sits kind of inside that 90 degree angle. Inside the main building, there's a flat either side and stairs in front. The immediate entrance hall is very dark. I feel like the lights choose when and when not to work as well. The flats are basic. A hallway, two double door bedrooms, a bathroom, decent living room and small kitchen. The hallway is quite long and the living room is at the end of it. Both bedrooms face each other so we can talk from our doorways, if that makes sense. I'm telling you this too because it'll help you picture the incident. So it was about 11, 11.30 at night and my flatmate was in her room presumably sleeping. She had a habit of leaving things unlocked and I have to make sure everything is locked up before I head off to sleep. But she'd gotten better and normally at least had the chain on the door, if it wasn't locked that is. She always goes to bed early though so it wasn't weird or anything. I was in the living room and decided to grab a pint of water before heading to bed myself. I went into the kitchen which is attached to the living room, switching on the kitchen light and filling up a glass. The car park in front of the flat was really dark. I remember feeling kind of eerie that night too and I just wasn't sure why but I just felt like something was off. 
if I had to describe it, it was that kind of feeling that you get when you switch the light off and you run up the stairs. Anyway, I had a couple of sips and filled the glass a little more and headed out to the kitchen when the front doorbell went. I sort of froze. I didn't even know that we had a doorbell, to be honest. About 10 seconds passed before the letterbox was hit twice and my stomach sank. I sort of felt trapped in the kitchen. Important to know two things here as well. One, if you step out of the kitchen, it puts you in perfect line with the hallway if the living room door is open, which it was at that time. And two, our front door has a bloody window so you can see the silhouettes of anyone outside or in. Us being girls, we had a sort of cute grey curtain across it, but it was pretty much see-through. So, I grabbed my phone and I called my mate, who was in a room, right next to the front door. We both whispered, did you hear that? Both thinking that we may have misheard it. We had to whisper too, because the walls were like paper thin in that flat. You could always hear people coming and going in the clothes. She came to her bedroom doorway, but couldn't go forward because then she'd be in direct sight of the window. I edged my way out of the kitchen, keeping flat against the wall, eventually sinking to the floor, texting her now because we were both closer to the door and whoever was out there would probably hear us. Another thing that you should probably know is that this person must have buzzed other flats to get into the building, but didn't buzz ours. So I reckon that they must have seen me from the kitchen window. I'm a fairly ordinary looking 120 pound girl, but... Lying in kind of an army crawl, I saw the silhouette of a tall, broad, bald man. It could have only been a man as well, because he was so tall and broad. He tapped the letterbox again, but just sort of stood there. Terrified now, I mouthed to my mate, Did you lock the door? And she looked at me with a horrified expression on her face, and mouthed, No. The chain wasn't on the door either. Now or never, I supposed. I crawled as low as I could into my bedroom, crawled up to my desk, grabbed my keys, crawled to the door, it's only about a meter, and frantically shoved the keys in the lock and twisted, at the same time putting the chain on. This is a noisy affair too, and he obviously noticed that I was there, hitting the letterbox again and trying the handle as I desperately tried to twist the crap old school key in the lock, and eventually I got it. Terrified to stand, my mate put her head out her room to see if we were cool and he wasn't there anymore. In a kind of half stoned, half asleep stupor, she reckoned to just go back to bed. But something was just nagging at me though, really badly. Remember how I said that we could hear people coming and going really easily? It was just eerily quiet and not once did either of us hear the building's main door open or close which meant that this was probably somebody in this building. He had one person across from us, two people above us and two above them. Two of those flats are students. A neighbor across was a 98-year-old woman. There was a couple and a sort of short, long-haired, chill guy. Nobody we knew matched the frame of the man in our flat window, but I stayed up until I couldn't anymore, texting mates, just sort of jamming in my room door shut, keeping my hockey stick next to my bed. But I realized about a month after this that the service button to the front of the main building was actually broken and anyone could have come in if they pressed it and could be unheard coming in if they were very quiet and knew that they had to be very careful with the door as it was old and heavy. I still think though that they must have seen me in the kitchen in the light and thought that they would try their luck. And this could have easily been a very different story if I hadn't have locked the door when I did. Always lock your doors, people. Double check them too, because no matter how safe you reckon your area is, it just may not be. We have literally no idea to this day who that was or why they knocked like that. But we never heard anyone again use that doorbell. I'll start by saying that I'm 19 years old and these hauntings occurred from 7 to 8 years old. I'm not a religious person at all. In fact, I'm one of those people that has to see something to believe it. When people tell me stories of how this or that happened to them, 
I always try to come up with a logical explanation for what they experienced. Now, that being said, this shook me to my core and I avoid sharing what happened to me with other people simply because I cannot even think about this time of my life without swelling up in tears. So, as a child I didn't like scary movies, ghost stories, and none of that stuff really. I was scared of the dark and bedtime, and for me it was a struggle because my mother would have to sit beside my bed until I went to sleep before she was able to leave the room. After I would fall asleep, I would always wake up at around 2am and be scared that I was alone and walk to my mother's room down the hall to get into bed with her and go back to sleep. The only people in the house during this time were my older sister, mum and me. Now... The first incident I had occurred when I woke up in the middle of the night again and I got up to go to my mother's room. When I got to her room and opened the door, that was when I saw it. An extremely pale, short, bald man was sitting in the middle of her bed. I was paralyzed in fear and just stared at this guy for a few seconds, trying to understand what I was looking at. The man's head rose and he looked at me as I stood in the doorway. His face was completely smooth no eyes, mouth, or anything, just a, a powdered white face. The moment that I saw him look up at me too, I immediately collapsed into the floor and started screaming and crying and calling for my mother to wake up. My mum jumped up out of bed and ran over to me and tried to calm me down. I was trying to tell her that there was a man in her room, but she kept telling me that it was just a bad dream, that I needed to go back to bed. I quickly looked around the room, intending to show her, but... I didn't see the man anywhere. When I calmed down a bit, I asked if me and her could both stay in my room for the night because I was too frightened to sleep alone, but I definitely didn't want to go back into her room after that. The morning after, I tried to explain to my mum what I had seen the night before, but she just didn't want to hear it. She shrugged it off and told me that it was just a bad dream again. I was so sure what I had seen, though, and I tried to tell my sister, but... She just dismissed me as well. After this experience, I was terrified that it would happen again, though. The following nights were horrible, too. My mother would tuck me into bed like usual and wait until I fell asleep to leave. Except now, I was freaking out that I was asleep, so she would go into her room. When she left, I would get up and turn on all the lights in my room, and I would just play around with my action figures or play on my PlayStation. I would do this until the next morning, in fact. It was during the day that I would take naps on the couch, but my mother didn't like that. She wanted to get out and play during the day so that I was able to sleep well at night. And obviously, this led to me losing an insane amount of sleep because I was too scared to sleep at night. But my mum wasn't going to let me sleep at all throughout the day. It had been around two or three weeks, I would say, since the first incident happened, and I was starting to think that... Maybe mum was right in that it had all been a dream. One day I was particularly exhausted and fell asleep on the couch in the living room and slept until the middle of the night. I woke up to a pitch black room and immediately began to have a panic attack. Even when I woke up in my own room, I always had nightlights that always stayed on. I got off of the couch and tried to use the power light on the TV to sort of help me to have a point to walk to because my room was the first room in the hall coming out of the living room. And when I got to my room and opened the door, there was that man sitting on the edge of my bed now. Now, as terrified as I was, I slowly closed my door back shut, hoping that the man hadn't seen me open the door and I immediately ran to my mum's room screaming and crying again telling her that he was in my room. She gets up and walks with me to my room, and again, there isn't anything there. I remember just being so confused at that time and questioning what was real and what wasn't. I told my mum that I wanted to go stay with my dad because I was too scared to stay with her anymore. And after contacting my dad, I told him everything that had been happening at my mum's. He talked to her and decided that I could come live with him. Talking to my dad about it was really tough too because... He didn't really believe in what I was saying. He also thought that I was just having bad dreams because I was watching scary movies or something at my mother's. But fast forward a few years and my mum is remarried with a man that had three children, the youngest of which was six years old. Over the time that they stayed in the house, the youngest boy started to experience similar things to what I had. 
Now, when my mum told me that he was saying the same things that I was when I stayed there, I wanted to be like, I told you so. But at this point, my mum believed me and she actually sold the house not long after. Nowadays, we just sort of refer to our old house as the haunted house. It's really hard to talk to other people in person about it though. Because for some reason, it just it makes my eyes water and I just feel terrified even thinking about it. Anyway, I just thought that I would share this here with you guys because, well, it's, it's good to get it off my chest. This happened to my mum about a year ago while she was visiting me. I woke up to get a drink around 4am one night. My mum works third shift so she was still awake and I decided to hang out with her. She told me that she had just got back from the 24-7. When my mum was on her way back from the store though, around 3.30am, she could see what looked like a person crawling on the road. She rolled her window down and as she got closer she could hear a woman screeching absolute bloody murder. My mum described her as looking like her jaw was about to unhinge. My mum isn't easily fooled, but she wasn't going to just flat out ignore the situation either. She remained in a locked car and yelled out to see if the woman was okay and maybe if she needed the cops. The girl just starts going on about how her parents are after her or something. As the girl is rambling, my mum sees a car coming up from the other direction. My mum yells at her to get out off the road and as she notices the car, she gets up like it's no problem. The car passes and then a guy that seems like her boyfriend appears out of nowhere. He's yelling at the girl like, oh babe, I'm glad you're okay. He's saying just random stuff and trying to get her to go with him. She doesn't seem afraid of him, but just as he notices my mum, he's at my mum's window practically instantly. He covered about 20 feet in what seemed like a split second. This whole ordeal was just too strange, so... My mum just ended up speeding out of there and once my mum made it back to my house, she called the police. They told her that they'd actually received one or two calls about this already that night and they didn't act too concerned. But as my mum told me this story, it just made my skin crawl. This all happened about a 10 minute walk from my house at most. I've never had any kind of problem in the three years that I've lived here and nothing even close to this has happened since, but it was... Uh, a strange one, that's for sure. To quickly preface my recent experiences, I believe it's important to know a few things. I'm a 27 year old female. I've lived in my house going on 13 years now. The house belonged to my maternal grandparents and my family moved in originally to help take care of my ill grandmother. She uh, unfortunately passed away three years ago, but we continue to stay to help take care of my grandfather now. My grandfather is the second person to have ever owned this house. The couple previously, they bought it when it was built in the 70s and only stayed for a few years before moving away. The point of all this being that my house does not have any extensive history since my family has no more or less been the only people to ever live here. But I must admit though that I've never really liked living here. We moved in at the end of my sophomore year of high school and since day one, I've always been just uncomfortable. My home is a breeding ground for negativity. To avoid airing out all the details of my family's personal issues though, I'll just say that tension is always high in my house. People are constantly fighting and mental illness runs rampant in my bloodline too. The air is just thick with aggression and suffocating amounts of stress all the time. It's no surprise to me that paranormal stuff happens here. So it started out with small things like hearing someone call my name when no one had, finding lights turned on when they were off, seeing things in the corner of my eye, items going missing and then appearing again suddenly or feeling a sort of cold chill on the back of my neck like someone is behind me but nobody's ever there. Truthfully I didn't pay too much mind to that stuff. Sure I found it odd but not creepy enough to keep me up at night or anything. But then, 2013 happened. I started having these sort of insomnia episodes all of a sudden. I've had bouts of insomnia before, but this was different. 
it was as if my body just wouldn't let me sleep, like it was waiting for something. It started to be that late in the night, I would also smell something burning. Not like that campfire smell or the aroma of cooking, but like something was actively on fire. The first time I smelt it, I jumped up immediately and ran throughout my whole house to check and make sure that it wasn't burning down with everyone unaware. It's a small single floor home with no basement and only a crawlspace attic, so I got through it pretty quickly, checking every single room. I touched the walls and I touched the ceilings to feel for any heat, but there was nothing. I looked outside to check neighboring houses and our shed, all the while with the intense smell of fire lingering in the air, but still I didn't see anything. But the smell was so strong I felt like I was choking on it, until suddenly after a few minutes it just disappeared. This continued to happen for weeks straight as well. Every night the smell would come to me, and every night I would begin my routine of checking my house again. I got so paranoid in fact that something was actually going to be on fire that I wouldn't allow myself to just ignore it. I began doing nightly walks around outside of my house to check every possible place for a fire, but never saw a thing. Now, about two weeks into my nightly walkthroughs, I began to notice these sort of small sparks of light on the ceilings that would follow me through the room. The light was like um, a dying sparkler, a small burst of brightness that would travel above my head as I walked. The light didn't appear every night and only manifested when I would smell the fire. The light also would never follow me into my room when I had completed my nightly rounds. But during this time, the frequency of whispers that I would hear during the day and things going missing increased. And then I began to hear like soft sighs and whimpers outside of my window at random times of the day. Not uh, identifiable as an animal or a person, but once again I would check with no discoveries. These activities, though weighing heavily on my mental well-being, grew mundane and somewhat predictable. The things, however, grew worse in time when I began seeing the people. The first was the little girl in my kitchen. One night I headed out to grab myself a snack and as I turned the corner to step into my dark kitchen, the clear figure of a girl stepped directly in front of me in the doorway. Although there were no recognizable features, I knew straight away that she was a child with long hair and wearing a dress from a silhouette. I'm only 4'10 and she was at least a full foot shorter than me. She approached me so closely and so suddenly that I sort of gasped and I instantly reached for the light switch to my right and not breaking my eye contact with her dark shape, I watched as she vanished right before me when I flicked the light on. Another was the man that stood in the corner of my room. I only really started noticing him after the little girl. For many nights, I kept him in the corner of my eye, never daring to look directly at him. He wasn't there every night though, and he wasn't there all the time. He wasn't there until, well, he was. And he was there until, well, he wasn't. But what I mean is that there was just no continuity in his appearances. He was only ever there when I was laying in bed, and always only in the far right corner of my room. Eventually, I got the courage to look directly at him. Once again, no distinguishable features other than a masculine build, or roughly 5'10 if I had to guess, and he wore a hat, which was weird. When I'm laying down, my feet are sort of in line with the door to my room directly in front of me, but his body was always angled perpendicular, facing the door rather than me. And although his presence did make me nervous, he never really moved. Truthfully, the only one who terrified me was the man at the end of my bed. He frequented more than this little girl, but less than the man in the corner. But one strange thing too about this one is that I always was able to feel him before I saw him. But looking at him made me dizzy, so I tried my best to keep my eyes closed until I felt like he was gone. He was tall, slender, and most distorted out of them all. He always stayed at the foot of my bed though, but it varied if he was directly in front of me or not. Occasionally he would lean over, sometimes a little, sometimes a lot, but he was always just sort of staring at me. I, uh, I really don't like to think about him. 
It makes my stomach sink and my chest sort of heavy. But for months in the year of 2013, my nights consisted of variations of all these events. A few times, all three even appeared to me on the same night, and only once did the two men appear to me at the same time. But just as quickly as everything had begun, eventually it just stopped. I didn't see them anymore, I didn't smell the fire or see the lights on my ceiling, I always have and probably always will hear the whispers though. But it's obviously 2020 now, and my life has changed, well, a lot since then. I put myself through many years of college, I established my career, got a great job, and I've been saving for my future. But something has changed over the last two months. You see, during this pandemic I've been laid off and have spent the last month and a half almost entirely at home. About three weeks ago, I saw this little girl again, but this time she was in the reflection of the mirror at the end of my hallway. The mirror is floor to ceiling in length, and although it was during the day, the hallway was dark. And she was just sort of standing behind me in the reflection, but when I turned around, she obviously wasn't there. Twice last week too, a cool shiver was running down the length of my spine, and it woke me instantly from my sleep. Occasionally, I'll feel this presence at the nape of my neck when I walk through my house, and just three nights ago... I saw him again. When I sensed him at first, I thought that I was going to pass out. My stomach turned and my vision blurred again. When I finally allowed myself to look, there he was. Only this time, not at the end of my bed where I thought that he was going to be, but on the side of me, and this time, a lot closer. I uh, honestly wanted to cry so badly, but was so frightened that I could only really hold my breath for what seemed like an eternity. And when I had felt that he was gone, I quickly rushed to turn my lights on, and again, there was nobody there. I'm filled with nothing but dread and anxiety. Every night since then, I sleep with my lights on, and even though I'm doing everything in my power not to see them again, I just can't help but notice when they're around. I don't know why they came to me last time, and I don't know why they're coming to me now, but most importantly, I don't know how to make it stop. Do any of you guys have any ideas?